Stevenson. I've seen several of your faces before. Um, I am the new curator at the Sanford Museum. I put new in quotations. I've been the curator for two years, but during that time there was indeed a pandemic, so it made it a little hard to have people come to the museum, understandably. So uh, I have to do a little plug, because you invited me here. If you haven't been to the Sanford Museum, we are free to the public. I like to joke it's the best free thing in town. Uh, I am a little bit biased, so please forgive me. We are open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 9 to 5. We, our old times used to be kind of all over the place, so we made it a little bit more standard and easier for all y'all guys to come. We not only have a bunch of artifacts that represent Sanford's history from river boats to baseball to citrus to celery, which we'll hear a little bit about tonight. We do also have research files. Um, so if you ever want to research your house, uh, we may have a file on it. And if we don't, we will show you how you can use our Polk City directories to, to use them. Um, so I do hope to come and see you at the museum. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let's talk a little bit about Sanford's kind of, oh no, oh. Savannah, that you'd be my lovely Vanna White and help me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about uh, Sanford's history with kind of agriculture and gardening and that. And the first thing we really need to talk about is citrus and Sanford because it is really one of the reasons why Sanford was even made as a town. So our town founder was a man named Henry Shelton Sanford. Um, he was involved in a lot of different things. Really him finding the town of Sanford is a footnote in himself. And that's a whole other lecture I can give. So for today, we're just gonna be talking about him building the town of Sanford. So he bought the land grant in 1870. And one of the reasons was not only our proximity to the river and how we were the end of the line for the river boats uh, for the St. John's River, thinking that we would become a major port town. He was hoping that we'd be like the New York City of the South. Uh, plus his heart, as we say. <laughs> that did not happen. <laughs> but we were a prosperous port town, I want to put that out. But the other reason is he was kind of uh, looking for gold, but not in the gold that you would think, the golden orbs of citrus. Um, it's hard to kind of believe that citrus was such a big deal. And we were thought at that time to be what was considered below the frost line. So that's that's kind of the idea that frost wouldn't harm it. If any of you have tried to grow citrus, you know that it doesn't really do well in frost, like it will die. Um, I also want to point out, I am not a gardener myself. I study uh, dead people. I like to joke because of that. I do not have a green thumb on me. The amount of plants I have unintentionally killed. Um, but I do study how you know plants are very important to people, <laughs> um, especially in Stanford. I do want to point that out. So if I say anything that is you know, ecologically wrong, please correct me. Uh, I am a historian, so I study uh, like what people leave behind in their primary sources. I do not study biology. Um, so Henry Sanford himself actually invested in his own personal growth, um, if you can go to the next slide, called the Lair. Um, I know these are not amazing pictures, so we have some other, if you want to look a little bit closer of the Lair. Um, that I have over on this table. And he made, and, and this was an experimental garden, so he was using this garden to kind of showcase what could be grown in this area. Um, he grew 140 different varieties of citrus, and he is credited with bringing the Jaffa and the Valencia oranges, which you can still find in your grocery store, to Florida. And because of that, he is in the Citrus Hall of Fame, which they have Hall of Fame for everything, apparently. <laughs> Um, and citrus was huge. It's hard to kind of explain why that is. It was an exotic fruit that one would really only have for special occasions. And one of the best examples that I like to, to talk about is, have, do any of you have the tradition at your house that like you get a orange and a penny in your stocking? Because I grew up with that. Um, and the religious reason is apparently Santa is based off of Saint Nick and he apparently wants to report gold orbs to save these women from doing the world's oldest job um, and their stockings, and that's the whole story with that. But the other reason, it was an expensive fruit. It was hard to grow. And during this time after the American Civil War, um, Henry Sanford, as well as other Northern investors, 
realized that citrus was a way to rebuild the southern economy, especially in Florida, because it was such a luxury fruit. Before, it's really being grown in Spain, of places. And so this would kind of cut out that middleman. Later on, California would also grow oranges, and that was a huge important thing. But also the tourism it brought. It's, it's hard to believe that people would just be like, instead of Disney, honey, let's bring the kids. We're going to go walking through orange groves. Uh, but it was a thing. Uh, we, we have a letter, especially um, from Apple Sanford, Henry Sanford's daughter. She actually got married here in Sanford uh, due to kind of sad reasons. Her father just recently passed, and they're trying to balance mourning customs with her getting married. And as she writes to her fiance, she says, because she arrives here, that she went walking through her father's groves and just how absolutely stunning these brilliant orange orbs are. And just, she writes this whole little soliloquy about them, um, soliloquy about them. And I also want to talk about another important thing with citrus and the citrus industry here is how it brought in people and how you have to kind of think. If you're growing something that's on this scale, who are the people that you're employing to, to work there? Because you need a labor group. And that is an interesting story in itself. So originally, Henry Sanford hired uh, the local white community to work on the groves. And he did not think of them very favorably. Uh, he didn't think they worked reliably. Uh, there's several la uh, letters where he uses some choice words about them. So he hires actually people. Uh, that were for formerly enslaved from northern Florida and brings them down. And uh, that white community that was fired because they didn't work as hard was not happy about this, that this, this new influx of black workers were coming and they kind of viewed stealing their jobs. And with that, they did try to scare the local uh, black population that did come for, for this through racial violence. They went through their houses and tried to do these raids where they would Kind of be shooting their guns trying to scare them off. And Henry Sanford, uh, wanting to protect these people, actually made Georgetown, uh, which recently became part of the historic register as, as, a, as a new place. So um, that's the history of Georgetown. It was specifically made by Henry Sanford to keep those workers safe. Now there's some question, is how much Henry Sanford's doing this because he's an altruistic man? Uh, he's trying to protect his labor force. The other thing is he is a Lincolnian Republican, and uh, he is very interested in flipping the state of Florida from what was, it was at that time mainly Southern Democrat, to be Republican. And because um, black men recently got the right to vote, and this is, Florida's very, Sanford's very interesting. We had, don't have, there's this period of time called Reconstruction, where we last a little bit longer because of the influence of Henry Sanford. Um, of this period where the United States Army is basically seeing that we're forcing what happened after the American Civil War and making sure that the amendments that were recently passed to help uh, uh, black uh, men specifically uh, be able to um, kind of have rights. Later on, there's a compromise in 1885, I believe, and that's when the era Jim Crow happens. But it lasts a little bit longer in Sanford. Um, and and Henry Sanford may have been trying to flip the state, and black men tended to vote Republican because, you know, Abraham Lincoln freed them. That's probably in the best interest to vote that way. So a little bit of that, but the racial violence does still, unfortunately, continue to happen um, in Sanford. And so what happens is Henry Sanford decides in 1871 to import another group of people, which is our Swedish colony, <laughs> which is hard to believe. Um, and they were not too, too happy. Uh, a lot of them were carpenters, uh, and they, were, they came here for the contract labor law, which was almost like indentured servitude. They had to work for five years, and that would pay for their passage. And since a lot of these people were carpenters, I, I don't know if somebody misled them that, like, yeah, you'll be working with wood, orange groves, spoilers. Uh, and they're like, this is, this is not what my, my feel is. We did have a historian think that some of our houses and some of the houses that you may live in were actually built by those Swedish workers that brought their carpenter skills and uh, kind of did freelance to build these houses. But we've never had like a smoking gun. If, so if any of you starts discovering like Swedish written and like pencil with wood in, please let me know. I would be very interested in that. 
Um, so this, so that kind of created a period where he did have this labor force. And again, this is all being based on citrus and the citrus industry. And unfortunately, um, yeah, uh, remember how I told you we, we had we were below the frost line? That that was not true. Um, turns out we, we are not below the frost line. And we had the Great Freeze of 1895-96. And um, basically the citrus industry was destroyed that winter. Uh, we, there are some sources that describe the sap of the trunk literally freezing and exploding the trees. And some people describe it sounding like when they were back in the Civil War hearing our artillery go off. Um, and and the problem was like, well, you can regrow citrus. Well, it takes about five to 10 years of growth to have viable fruit again. So these people who traveled here, because people traveled all over the world to come live in Sanford and try to get their piece of the pie with citrus. Henry Sanford advertised all over the world. We had an English colony. We had a first, the Ohio colony that was mainly people that were first generation Americans, that their parents were from Germany. Um, we had Hungarians, we had Italians, and they all made their kind of investments to help in the citrus industry, and it's gone within within a winter. Um, and so Sanford becomes a ghost town, and thank you so much for touring. No, it does not become a ghost town because we're all here right now. But we did have a massive migration period because of that. And we decide to, once again, uh, do something very similar, put all of our eggs in one basket with celery. <laughs> and you might be like, okay, why? And citrus and celery are more common than you think. It's hard to believe it, but back in the Victorian era, celery was considered a luxury vegetable. <laughs> uh, I think there's a taste.com article, and I think the title was perfect to kind of show the the attitude of the time period, which is, celery was the avocado toast of the Victorian era. <laughs> um, and you can actually see in menus of high-end restaurants that the celery is more expensive than the caviar. Um, and it's, why, why is that? There's several different reasons. Uh, one, it was a very ornamental plant, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, a very ornamental plant. In fact, like people would have originally these vases to elegantly show off their celery stalks. And then later on they have these oblong, and you might find these in like your own family's stuff. Like what is this weird oblong dish? It's for celery to just show it off um, on your dinner plate. And not only that, like this is actually a menu and you can actually see the amount of celery and how expensive it was compared to other items. One of the things that I found interesting is I think the most expensive item on here is celery fed duck. They would feed these ducks like celery seed and it was supposed to impart a flavor of celery. Um, I don't know how true that is. I don't know if somebody who had gross ducks, he didn't have gross ducks, raised <laughs> ducks, uh, would want to try that. I also don't know if it's ethical for the duck. Um, we no longer have celery fed duck, um, but it is the most expensive thing on this menu. Um, so that was kind of a big proponent, but also it was hard to grow. Uh, celery needs to have at least uh, a few, I think it's like four months of constant kind of roughly 70 degree weather and for the ground to be moist. And a lot of people didn't think that celery would grow in Florida because, you know, it's really hot here. Yeah. And the main producer of celery at that time was Kalamazoo, Michigan. Like, totally different climate than us. But I do want to talk about who are our first people to introduce celery to Sanford because it's a little bit of a debate. I have my own person that I personally think thought introduced celery to Sanford. Um, but I do want to go through all of them. And one of them I want to bring up is because the story about uh, this woman is really about her garden. So this is uh, Sarah Apple uh, Appleyard. Uh, she is considered one of the first people um, to grow celery. Um, there was an article written in the All Florida Magazine published in 1958, written by Catherine Sherbor who is her granddaughter. So there is a little bit of bias considering she's trying to talk about her grandmother in this light. Um, that says that she was the first person to grow celery here. And the story goes, at that time, apparently congressmen gave you seeds. 
of all different plants that you can just grow in your backyard, and it was kind of a good campaigning technique. And everyone just used the celery seeds for seasoning because, like, it's not going to grow in Florida. It, it, celery grows in Michigan. Everybody knows that. Um, but apparently, she planted it, and it grew like gangbusters. And everybody saw it, like, oh my gosh, you can grow celery here. And through her garden, it changed our industry in Sanford forever. I have some doubts about this story. I do think that maybe she did have a very prosperous garden. Um, I don't. I don't think the timeline fits because there's two other individuals that were already growing celery at that time on an industrial scale. And so I want to talk about them next. So this is Joseph Whitner over here. Uh, actually, both of these gentlemen have lovely mustaches. Um, so he originally had a citrus grove. So he was one of these citrus grove uh, growers in 1871. And after the freeze, he started planting celery. But what's also interesting about uh, Whitner is he called himself a professor of theoretical and practical agriculture. And he wrote this book. Gardening in Florida, um, which was published in 1885. And in it, he's kind of talking about all the different things that you can really grow in this area and other places in Florida. And in it, he specifically talks how celery is good in the state. So we know by 1885, Whitner already knew that celery was good in, in the state. Um, and, uh, and he doesn't fully do that until like the 1890s after the freeze. Um, we also have an eight, uh, 1898 Times Union report that the first solid refrigerated car of celery was shipped from Sanford to New York City. Um, and the shippers were Joseph Whitner, his brother, a Captain H.F. Whitner, and this gentleman over here, I.H. Twilliger. And there's between 300 and 400 crates in the car. Um, so now we're going to talk about this gentleman right here, uh, Isaac Twilliger. Uh, not to be confused with your historical uh, with your president, um, he did do some research trying to find out if he was related to him. Sadly, that was not the case. Different Twilliger. <laughs> so uh, there was a story, an, a radio talk actually by Ed Lane, um, who actually the Ritz Theater at one point owned uh, when it was the Mylane Theater. He said that he planted celery in Sanford in 1896, and the Whitners didn't plant it until 1897, and J.E. Peace was really the one who really went gangbusters. Um, and so, and the Twilligers were very prosperous, and they farmed pretty much until about 1910, and then they decided to go into concrete. And they're like, what does concrete have anything to do with celery? They, they don't seem connected at all. Well, apparently he, there was a connection. Uh, he experimented with the concrete and made these pockets for celery um, to, use, to make irrigation, to make that kind of swampy field happen a little bit longer. Um, and he's considered an innovator in the celery industry because of that. Um, so if you're ever, if you live out on like Celery Avenue and you discover these weird concrete pockets, uh, that is thanks to this gentleman over here. Um, because he made those pockets himself. And I kind of want to talk about, actually, is there, do you want to go to the next slide? Is there another one where's the celery fields? Uh, <coughs> it shows the uh, garden in front of the Sanford house. Okay, if you can go back one, because I want to talk a little bit. Uh, one more, sorry. Here we go. So, I do want to talk about like, why celery was so big, uh, because it was a huge gamble and a huge success in Sanford. Um, so a Sanford man complains in 1914 uh, in the Sanford Herald that he's been raising celery for 14 years and his best yield he made was $1,800 per acre and he had 16 acres. So we're going to do some math. I am also not a mathematician, so forgive me. But I did go on a website called measuringwork.com and you can basically go in there and plug in like 1914 to 2022, what would be how much it would cost today with inflation. And I had that it would cost, basically in today's money, it'd be $48,000. So that's $48,000 per acre and times that by 16. So that's a lot of money to make in a year <laughs> with a yield. So people flocked from all over to the, we were called the Celery Delta at one point, to make their fortune. Sadly, like our citrus industry, uh, our celery industry also 
is no longer here. Our last family farm was sold in the mid-1970s. And there's several different reasons of that. Uh, one, a uh, man named Sam Bird, uh, who actually at one point was a Broadway actor. He was um, on Broadway for the play performance of Mice and Men. Um, and he wrote a book called Small Town South, and it was a scandalous book at the time. He wrote about everybody's gossip. He changed everybody's names, but everybody knew who it was. Um, but he does talk about uh, that he thinks that one of the reasons that celery was starting to die by the time he wrote this book was the draining of the elder blades. And it was much cheaper to buy land down in South Florida. And not only that, that land was a lot more fertile and had the silt deposits. And fertilizer at that time was growing more expensive. So people were like, to heck with it, I'm just gonna move down to South Florida and grow celery there. The other reason that I've also heard is we over flooded the market because Kalamazoo, Michigan was growing the celery in the uh, summer months and we were really growing in kind of the winter and spring months that there was just a constant flow of celery happening in, in this area. So no longer was it the avocado toast of the past, it is now the receptacle for peanut butter that you give your child to make them eat vegetables. <laughs> so, I also want to point out our celery was a little bit different than that you know peanut butter receptacle that we have now. Uh, they used to do this thing called boarding the celery, where they would, and you can see it here. See these weird boards? They would either use this out of paper. Actually, this is a good one that they're, they're using the paper, or they would use something called pecky boards, um, and they would board it up so the sunlight wouldn't get in. Um, because the sunlight would turn it green and make it stringier. Um, and they also used a variety called Golden Pascal. So very much like how white asparagus is different than regular asparagus, we kind of grew a white celery, if that makes sense, where it wasn't as stringy and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I like the stringy, it, you, you have to work for it a little harder, I feel like, but that's, that's just me. Um, I have not had the opportunity to try this Golden Pascal variety, so if any of you want to go try that and give it to one of the, you know, many restaurants down here, I would love that. I, I would love to try Golden Pascal variety. Um, so it was a little bit different and a little bit more labor intensive uh, to grow the celery. Celery is still grown in Seminole County with a veto uh, in the Dudal family, and you can actually go to your grocery store and kind of buy dandy celery, and you can see that in part of the year it's grown in Salinas, California, and the other part it's in Oviedo. So uh, kind of an interesting note that you can still buy Seminole County celery, just not Sanford celery. So I do want to talk a little bit about a, uh, if you want to go to the last slide, um, something that's more of an ornamental garden. Um, because Henry Sanford knew that Florida in itself has a unique kind of plant group to it, uh, that we can grow things that no other place can, and you can draw tourists to it. So this is actually the Sanford House and Hotel Gardens. Um, this was built uh, by Henry Sanford's company called the Florida Land and Colonization Company to draw on house tourists. And one of the things that were very popular is that he made this park that people would be able to take photos. Um, and so we have all these photos of these people promenading in the park, like, look at these weird plants. Um, like, I love this picture because you can see the 1880s clothing. Like, she is wearing her bustle. She's having an asymmetrical, like, overskirt. Look at that hat. It's ridiculous. Um, I love it. Uh, and she has her lovely gentleman companion with his little top hat. Like, it is, they look like they're posing for prom, but they're in their 30s or 40s. Um, and I think it really shows like they are coming to Florida to witness this nature, to witness these unique plants. Um, here's another one where it's a century plant where you have these two little children posing by the giant century plant. Uh, that's like their big photo that they took. And I don't know, it brings, it kind of shows you a little bit like with the revival of things like Instagram and such where people are taking all these pictures in gardens or going to national parks and it's actually a little bit of a problem where they're destroying um, the parks but it does show that people have always found a connection to nature and wanting to cultivate that nature to kind of tell the story of, of where they are or where they've been 
So um, I know a lot of you may have gardens of your own. I don't uh, because as I said, I kill everything that I touch that's a plant. Um, so I do hope that you hear some of these stories and you guys are inspired in yourselves because Sanford kind of history is, is grown from the ground up, you can say. So thank you so much. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, I was wondering, Bel Air, yes. that was just like original grow. Do you know in like today's Stanford where yes. that was? Chase Groves. So that's a subdivision. So if you're on 25th Street and it's you pass the 417 like bypass, mm -hmm. there used to be like a I don't know if it's still there, like it's a Walmart neighborhood market and it's on this little hill, that's where it would have been. Mm -hmm. Um what actually happened to Bel Air is a little sad. When Henry Sanford died, um, his wife Gertrude, uh, his wife Gertrude did not like him investing in Florida. She quote called it the vampire upon our finances, um, which made sense because she had like eight children, most of them girls, and she wanted to marry them off. And Henry Sanford kept on investing in very risky speculations, um, and Sanford was kind of one of those risky speculations. Um, she was trying to weigh desperately to find money so she could live the lifestyle that she had because after when Henry Sanford died, all of those investors were like, okay, where's my money? And she's like, uh, there is no money. Um, and so they had to quickly try to sell it. So they sold it to Ethel's uh, new husband, who was her first cousin once removed. It was very much a marriage of convenience. Uh, he was 22 years older than her. She was 18 and he was 40. Um, and he wanted nothing to do it. He did it as like a family to help the family. He sold it for a dollar to the Chase family. That's how badly he just wanted to get rid of it. And um, 1920, I think in the 1920s, uh, there used to be like a little house there called the Lodge and that burned down. Um, so it never really fully got back to being that experimental garden in Groves that once was after when Henry Sanford died. Um, any other questions? Where is Georgetown? Right over there. <laughs> it's actually, the boundaries I believe are 2nd Street, Sanford Avenue, because Sanford Avenue used to be the historic uh, black shopping district, and uh, I believe Mellonville to 13th. There's some debates that it goes a little bit further, um, but that's at least what the, you know, National Political Constitution thinks of it. Um, sorry, the National Register thinks of it. Uh, so those are the boundaries. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of, there's a specific style of building you can see in those areas that were, were um, for it. St. James A&E is a really good, uh, I would say kind of architectural feature of, of Georgetown because it was uh, designed and built by Prince Strober, who was a black architect. Um, so kind of very interesting piece of history there. Uh, the museum does carry walking tours, brochures of Georgetown, um, so. And there is going to be a history harvest, like a celebration, in collecting Georgetown's history um, October the 15th and 14th and 15th, I believe. So if you guys are interested in knowing a little bit more about the history, uh, we would love to see you there. Uh, any other questions? I feel like I have like a little rant for each question. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate you.